Hi, I'm Daniel Whiteson, particle physicist, professor at UC Irvine, podcaster, and author. So what does a particle physicist do exactly? Well, there's different flavors of particle physicists, from theorists you might have heard about who try to explain everything that we see, to experimentalists who are a little bit less glamorous but try to find new stuff that needs explaining. I'm an experimentalist because I want to force the universe to reveal what its fundamental nature is, what it's made out of. This question is exciting to me because figuring out what the universe is made out of might tell us something basic about how it works, what its real nature is. I'm not talking about what's in the universe, stars and planets and kittens and lava and other stuff made of atoms which are made of protons and neutrons and quarks and electrons. That's what's in the universe. There was a time before the first stars and even the first atoms and quarks. I want to figure out what the universe's most basic element is that always had to exist that defines what it is. That's the question that motivates my science, the one that I have devoted my entire life to. If I could speak to an oracle and ask it one question or get to have a conference with advanced aliens, I'd love to ask them to tell us the answer before the aliens eat us for lunch or nuke us from space or whatever. Until then, we're stuck figuring it out ourselves. So here I am in my office in beautiful Southern California. What do I do every day to figure out what quarks and electrons are made out of? This kind of work requires smashing particles together at super high energy, which costs billions of dollars. So I don't have my own personal collider. I mean, nobody does, though Elon Musk could if he thought that was more exciting than launching rockets into space. So thousands of particle physicists from around the world get together and all build one big collider to work on together. The bigger the collider, the higher the energy, the more weird new kinds of stuff we can make, the deeper we can look inside the matter we know and love and learn what's on nature's menu. So we each build one piece of the collider or detector systems and then take turns pitching in to run it. I was actually in the control room of the LHC when there was a big accident in 2008 and I was hoping to get to smash that emergency button, but I didn't get to. Because there's only one of these huge colliders on the planet at a time, most particle physicists don't live near it. The current biggest one is at CERN outside Geneva, and I'm nine time zones away from it here in California. So I don't commute to CERN every day or even spend more than a couple of weeks there every year. No, I usually just ride my bike to campus every morning and work remotely. Because particle physicists are scattered around the world, we've been doing online meetings for years, well before everyone else was Zooming. So now we have it that you can actually operate the collider remotely. And the data, of course, is shared all around the world, from CERN to sites everywhere on all continents. So I can sit in Southern California and use data from Switzerland to understand the universe. When people hear that I'm an experimental physicist, they imagine that I have a lab underground somewhere filled with electronics and big lasers to zap stuff. I don't, or I'd love to show it to you. My lab is at CERN. It's super far away, so most of my time is spent working on the computer. My wife, who's a biochemistry professor here at UC Irvine, has a lab filled with like stuff that's dripping and machines that go whirr and people dripping stuff from one tube into another. So she likes to joke that she runs the real Whiteson lab, and you know, maybe she's right. Working on a project with 5,000 other scientists has lots of pros and cons. On the good side, you get to build things that you could never build by yourself, like $10 billion physics facilities to unravel the nature of the universe. And you get to meet lots of brilliant people from around the world and learn about their culture and eat their special pastries. On the other side, working in such a big group of people always comes with lots of management and politics, especially when people have different cultures and clashing styles of resolving disagreements. You wouldn't believe how long we spent arguing about whether a sentence needs a comma or not. And every paper has everyone listed as an author in alphabetical order, so I'm always somewhere near the end. Working in a collaboration means that you don't have to do everything from soup to nuts to produce your own science. The way to operate in such a big collaboration is to find your niche, your specialty, your way to contribute in a way that nobody else can, your unique ideas. My group helped build the trigger system, which decides which data to keep and what to toss. We collide particles 40 million times every second, which means we make way too much data to store or to analyze. And most of the time when two protons collide, nothing very interesting happens. So you want to filter out the good stuff from the boring stuff. We use super fast hardware and a huge bank of computers to make these keep kill decisions very quickly. Even just this part of the system has hundreds of people who contributed from around the world, not just my group. 
In terms of physics, my group specializes in using new machine learning techniques to squeeze as much information as possible out of the data, to look for dark matter particles and to find new, weird, unexpected stuff that could blow up our understanding of the universe. And when I say my group, I mean my research team, the postdocs and students who I advise. Here are a few of them. I'm Michaela Vizella, postdoc. My name's Kevin Greif, I'm a PhD student. I'm Levi Condren, and I am a grad student. I'm Jake Rudolph, graduate student. My name is Ryan Miller, and I'm a PhD student. I'm Seth Nabbitt, student researcher. Hi, I'm Chris Wu, and I'm a student researcher. And when I say our research, I mean all the work that mostly they do. As a student, you typically have one project, and you do all the real work involved. As an advisor, I have my fingers in many projects, and I do very little of the nitty-gritty work. So what do I actually do? I come up with new ideas, I guide the students, I love talking to them about what they're doing, I help them solve their problems, I help them write their papers, I write the grant proposals, I worry about the funding, and I always have one small project where I'm the one doing the nitty-gritty work, the day-to-day -day coding, because in the end, that's my jam. I love coding and solving problems with data, not just emails and spreadsheets. But in the end, most of my day is spent in front of the laptop. However, sometimes I get to get in the classroom and teach, which I absolutely love. Here's a little snippet of me teaching a few years ago. Uh, today we're going to talk about momentum. Yay! I don't think anybody's ever cheered the word momentum before. So far, we haven't found the particle that makes up dark matter, or figured out what's inside the electron, or found any new heavy particles beyond the Higgs boson but we still have lots and lots of data to look through and the collider is being upgraded soon so we can use it to look for even weirder, more rare things that we didn't even expect. When I'm not doing particle physics or teaching, I'm the co-host of a podcast, Daniel and Kelly's Extraordinary Universe, where we talk about all of the big questions in the universe, black holes, string theory, the size of the universe, the fundamental nature of it, what it all means, all that good stuff in a way that's accessible to anyone who's interested in these questions, even if you don't have a physics background. And I wasn't joking about talking to aliens about physics. I'd love to answer these questions myself and win the Nobel Prize, but if aliens come before we can do that, I'd be also very happy to just ask them for the answers. Because it's nice to imagine that the questions we're wrestling with are the same ones that any intelligent technological civilization might face. But maybe it's too tempting an idea, too flattering to imagine that our science is somehow universal. What if there's some cultural bias we haven't thought of? What if alien physics is more alien than we can imagine? So I just wrote a book trying to answer that question, whether aliens do physics the way we do. It's called Do Aliens Speak Physics? And it's co-written and illustrated by my friend Andy Warner. It's out November 5th, so please check it out. Thanks for watching to the end of this video and for being curious about the nature of the universe. Remember that science is by the people and for the people. Your curiosity is what makes science happen. It's the reason that my job exists. So thank you very much.